Nothing is as dangerous as love. She spins alone, she rides and moans. We burned it down, we left our Maple syrup with butter, yeah, but we're not in Canada, we're in Hawaii. So like we help make lilikoi butter, which is from passion fruit. Uh, and we, we do this thing called monkey butter, which is banana jam, things like that. On my farm, we grow bananas and lilikoi and all kinds of great fruit. So we tend to use those kinds of things rather than maple syrup. But those guys who drove 16 hours to see my movie, they gave me some Canadian maple syrup that I'm taking home. I've always been interested in animation. I did my first stop motion animation, I think, in sixth grade, um, junior high school, uh, as claymation. And so I've always been fascinated, but actually I went to school to study astrophysics. Um, I loved physics and I thought one day I could be an astronaut. Um, and things happened, that, a few things happened in quantum mechanics class. I decided to go somewhere else um, because of the kind of belief system that science had and it kind of jibed against what I was starting to feel and I started experimenting with like psychedelic drugs and they kind of opened my mind to a lot of other things and I already had a lot of talent in the arts and so I kind of just immersed myself in all kinds of art. Um, I studied non-western art and part of the reason why I live in Hawaii is I did field work in Tonga, Fiji and Samoa. But how I started animation, I started working with the Hawaiian community. I learned how to speak Hawaiian. And they, at the time, their videos basically were shooting children's textbooks and reading them in Hawaiian, just the illustrations. And I thought, well, let's do some animation with this. So I would actually do cut out, cut out these images from these children's books and move them a little bit. And every project, I upped the ante. I made them more and more complex. And, uh, and it just got more and more rich and dense and denser and denser with each project. And at some point I felt like I got to do something with this thing that I've developed, this more dense kind of cutout style. And that's the genesis of the style of animation that's used in Strange Frame. After moving to Hawaii, I couldn't get any jobs. I, Waterworld had just wrapped and it was such a fiasco. You know, it was a total financial disaster and fiasco. Nobody wanted to shoot on our island ever again. And um, that coupled with, uh, you know, economic shift at that time, I uh, couldn't get any jobs. I was working as a beekeeper. I was working as a substitute teacher. I was mixing sound at nightclubs for bands, doing anything to just stay alive and stay on the island because it's an incredible place to be. And I was a new father, and so I had to make money. Um, so I just took any job I could do whatever it took. I was working three jobs, I was working crazy hours. Um, but I put my name out there as much as possible. I went to the union and signed up, but you can't get, you can't get in a union unless you get a job. You can't um, get a job unless you're in the union. So this is catch 22. So they have to have, basically they have to have a big job come in where the union guys need somebody extra and it didn't happen. So I'm just like, oh my God, I'm never gonna work in this industry ever again. And um, uh, this live television show called The Jason Project had been rehearsing on our active volcano on my island for two weeks uh, to do these global broadcasts uh, um, about uh, the science that was going on on the volcano. And unfortunately, these two sound guys uh, with these long hours, they got in a car accident and uh, almost died uh, right the day before that the show was supposed to go live. And so I got a call in the middle of the night, uh, can you walk backwards over hot lava holding a boom mic? And fuck, I can do anything. For a buck, man, I could, at this point, I could do anything. Just get me back in the game. Um, and so I show up, and I got my hiking boots on, ready to walk on lava. And, and I didn't really know, I, I 
gone out to the volcano a bunch. I didn't really know what they were going to exactly have me do, but that's exactly what they had me do. There was a lava flow that was one hour old. The surface temperature of the ground was over 400 degrees. The air temperature was about 140. And there was a scientist out there, a geologist, and I had to walk backwards in front of him holding a boom mic in the dark at night and for a live broadcast to the UK. That was the first show. And I didn't have any rehearsals. You know, these guys have been rehearsing for two weeks, getting things down to make it as safe as possible. And I had to do it out there cold, live, on camera. Uh, not recorded, live. And so I go out there for the first take and I'm all set up and my wireless, everything tests out great. And we go live and I'm backing up, walking backwards with the boom and it's really freaking hot and I'm looking to make sure I don't step on any of the cracks because the cracks are over 700 degrees. You want to walk where it's all dark, uh, where it's cooled a little bit to 400. <laughs> and the glue that's holding my soles onto my boots melts and the soles start sliding off. And everybody's freaking out because they're all watching this happen live on, live on, live on television. And, and I get through, I, I managed to get through. The gaffer comes up with the staple gun. Boom, 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 puts the staples in. And I put my shoes back on. We're getting ready for the next one because it's live show after live show. And I get back in position. I'm walking backwards. I'm walking backwards. And the heat is coming right through my soles, through the metal of the staples into my socks and burning my socks from the inside. And I'm, I'll keep my cool. I'll keep my cool. I'll do this. I'll do this. And I get through that take, and so the gaffer comes back and he rips out the staples and puts duct tape, he rips the duct tape on, and, and we get ready for the next one live to New York, and I'm walking backwards, and I'm walking backwards, and the duct tape catches fire. You know, it's totally on fire, you know? And I get through that take, and basically after that, people are like, dude, we'll hire you for whatever, you know? And I just started getting a lot of jobs, and in fact, after that I went on, uh, to produce, co-produce and edit um, the definitive documentary about Volcanoes National Park, which got picked up by the Learning Channel and Discovery Networks and went around the world. And I ended up shooting and working on about 26 different productions on the volcano. And that, that's how my career started, true trial by fire. <laughs> In 1999, um, work, commercial work was starting to slow down for me. I was doing less and less projects for pay, and I thought I had also gotten to a point financially where I wasn't like starving all the time. <laughs> um, and so I contacted my old friend Shelly Doty, who is a big sci-fi geek and a rock star, and I said, let's do something together. And we pitched ideas back and forth, and we came up with some of the rules that we would set down to create our universe for Strange Frame. Independent animation is different than regular independent film, and uh, a lot of independent film is documentary. The budgets are so low when you're talking about live action and documentary work. I mean, it's like you could shoot a documentary uh, independently for 10 to 30 grand. You really can. I mean, it's really lowballing it, but you can. And you can do an independent feature, live action feature, for 100 to 300 grand. That's still really lowballing it. But typically for you know, paying people to sit at workstations for a couple of years, you're talking about, you're talking at least a couple million dollars, you know, um, and community funding that, I don't know if it's possible yet. I mean, if somebody comes up and takes the mantle and does it, um, great, you know, um, I still think that we need the big boys. And luckily, I have made some contacts with this movie and um, I'm hopefully going to meet with some studio executives um, over the next six months and talk about the possibility of turning Strange Frame into a TV series or continuing it as a movie. Um, but those are the big boys. And as you pointed out, sex, lesbians, uh, you know, all this kinds of stuff that, and drugs, especially, believe it or not, drugs is the biggest hang up for, for uh, foreign distribution. You know, it's not the lesbian, it's not the nudity, it's none of that stuff, it's the drugs. Um, and, uh, you know, even, even in, in our movie where the drugs are portrayed as a downfall thing, you know, um, it's still that they, they can't have it in there. Um, at least that's what I'm being told. We'll see. How I got my crew on Strange Frame was that in 2005, uh, I, I really wanted to do something rooted in the community. The island had given me so much. I, uh, working with Hawaiians was an incredibly rich experience, and they allowed me to get... Um, based in Hawaii, you know, there was always this 
pull to move back to the mainland because of the financial realities. It's really tough to make it on the island. I mean, I live in the middle of rainforest in the most economically depressed part of my state. And working with the Hawaiians allowed me to be creative and, um, and survive there and thrive there. And so I wanted to do something where I was giving back. So when I started this project, Strange Frame, I decided I would go out and I would find talented kids in the local community and train them in the style of animation. And so in 2005, I went around to the high schools and the community college, and I started teaching at the community college to try to find the best students. And um, they eventually became my crew. I, I had 40 kids go through my internship program, and out of that, we had eight hardcore people that worked on the film, and five of six of them were full-timers for four years. You know, I, I think that we all need to look at ways that we can give back to our local communities and make our communities stronger because that's what it's all about. It's all about having a great community to live in, right? You know, wherever you live. And you want to enrich that. And so taking that philosophy and applying it to the production process, you want to give moments where your artists can shine and you want to feature their strengths. And so there are definitely moments in the movie where once I identified an artist's strength, I said, okay, here's this chunk, it's yours, you know? And obviously I guided them so that we could dovetail it into the rest of the movie, um, but really it's, it's their little chunk of the movie, it's their movie within my movie, you know? And, and that fulfills them, you know? If, if I was working or one of these guys was working in one of the big production houses, you might just be working on the spittle on one of the character's mouths. And that's your job for the next three months is to follow that character's spittle through the 75 minutes that they're on screen. You know, And maybe they're fulfilled by that, I don't know. But it's to me, it wouldn't be fulfilling. And for most of my crew, um, they you know, wanted to express a little bit more. And so I gave them those opportunities. That being said, there are people that are happy with that the smaller jobs and, and uh, focusing on the craft of making a specific part work fluidly. Like one of my animators, when we got Tim Curry attached, she's like, I just want to do all Tim Curry's lips. I just, just give it all to me. I just want to do lips. I want to listen to Tim Curry all day long, you know, for the next few months. And so I gave that to her and she just loved it, you know, and it filled her up, you know, listening to Tim all day. So, you know. You want it. You want to inspire inspire your team, and you want your team to feel like that that they really have a big part in the whole process. And I think I, I think I gave it to them. I think I did. It's mostly self financed. Um, the other people that came on board are my friends, uh, and they came on because we had a really lucrative tax credit in Hawaii. So basically they could come on and they had zero chance of losing money because they get all their money back as a tax credit, even if the movie doesn't make any money. So I had complete creative control at that level. It did, as far as the cast, we did have a couple cast members that we were seeking out that couldn't do it because of the sex, not the drugs, not the lesbian, that just the sex. And it was really a personal issue. Um, there was some personal family problems with this one star. Um, but we're very, very happy with the cast we did get. And most of these actors have um, track records. I mean, Tim Curry, you know, come on, he was the sweet transvestite from Transylvania. I mean, come on. Our stuff's, I don't know if it's tame compared, but it's definitely in the same realm as Rocky Horror Picture Show. So um, he was very fun to work with. And uh, we were asking him, like, you know, how does it make you feel? He's like, oh, this movie makes me feel high, you know. <laughs> and I, I'm glad to have that response from him. One, one of the guys that I really um, appreciate. And he has the best voice. Uh, really, the reason we got the stars is because of my casting director, uh, Jamie Thomason, but it's also because it's so unique. Like, uh, Cree Summer and Tara Strong are probably the most booked voice actors uh, in the world. They, they do more stuff than, you put those two together, they must do more stuff than 10 other people or 20 other people. And they were excited because, in their words, it's like, oh man, what, another lesbian rock movie? You know, we've done that so many times, i.e. never, you know? Uh, and so it was very exciting for them to break out of uh, My Little Pony and things like that that they normally have to do for animation. And the other thing is that um, voice acting for live action actors 
uh, it's it's a it's a different kind of reach for them, but it's the most enjoyable because like Claudia Black, she could be with her kids in the morning, come do her voice session, and then be with her kids in the afternoon. And on a live set, you're there for 16 hours. You know, um, so voice acting is actually very sought after in Hollywood. For Cree and Tara is their ability to, to make their voices sound like whatever they want to, their, their range of characterizations that they come out with, but also their ability to take nuances and either, like if you said to them, okay, on this syllable, I want you to hit it this way. On this syllable, I want you to do the same as last take. They can do that. They have so much experience and so much control that they can, they can get exactly what you want. And if you don't have really an idea, they can give you 12 different ways, you know. Um, People that haven't done much voice acting um, and come from a live action background, you tend to have to work with them a lot more. You know, and in fact, working with Tara Strong, she taught me. I, I really learned from working with her. You know, more than me being the director. You know, you know, I was more the student in that case. Well, she's, so, Australian, she's Australian, but yeah. Australian. Okay. Um, no, I think she's deeper tonally than me. Um, but we can always keep it. Certainly, that first line is pretty far from her. Mm -hmm. Um, as long as I don't go too deep, then that's when we get into trouble, if I go too deep. Okay, so I think that we need to redo that second second line you did, the, the um, uh, noted tall and yummy noted, mm -hmm. um, because I think that you were going a little bit deeper on that. Uh -huh. Okay. No, um, typically voice acting is done uh, sequentially, you know, not all at the same time. I, I wanted to kind of do the lovemaking scenes in the same room. I don't know if it was because I wanted to be a voyeur onto it. Um, I just thought it would be uh, more effective, um, but I think that they did a, a fantastic job, even though they were totally separate when they were doing that. A lot of people were asking that, uh, were they making out while they were doing that? And I'm like, no, no, it's not like that, it's not like that. But it, it was great. It was a really great experience to work with these people. And Tim has such a delicious voice. You can't not be happy with a take. I mean, even if he gets the words wrong and it just botches everything, which is very rare, it's just his, it's such a richness and depth and uh, the wetness and everything about the voice just draws you in. Um, there's, in the surround sound version of the movie, it's kind of exemplary about working with Tim, because all of his takes were so good that we, in the 5.1 mix, we took five different takes and put one in each speaker, <laughs> you know, a different take of, of the line, so there are a little bit intonation differences on it, and it's all happening around you. It's the Tim Curry immersion experience right there. And I, yeah, he's, he's fantastic, and, and he, he works really quick, too. Um, I, I just feel so blessed that he was part of this project. So I didn't really look at it as, okay, this is an African-American film. Um, I uh, looked at it as that Shelley and I wanted to set it beyond uh, the point of race and gender. They're like proxy battles really to distract us from the real war, which is class warfare. 